uh, hello everybody and welcome. It's lovely to see so many of you here. Um, as Rory said, my name's Rebecca. Um, I'm the editor of Carb News and I'm delighted to be here to have this conversation because I think it's a very, very important one to have. Um, so to start off, I'm going to interview Javier Borelli um, and then I'm going to pass over to Nathan who will introduce um, Olivia um, and then we'll listen to our two esteemed guests before going on to having, having a conversation. So Javier is responsible for membership at El Diario AR, which is the Argentine branch of El Diario.es, and I'm really sorry for my pronunciation, Javier. Um, before that, he was founding president of the cooperative newspaper Tiempo Argentino, uh, which launched the first membership model in the country, and he's currently a media consultant on sustainability and membership issues uh, for Fondo Velocidad. Um, so let me hand over to Nathan, who will introduce our second guest. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really pleased to, to introduce Olivia Henry, who's a kind of up and coming leader in the uh, world of cooperative journalism. Uh, I got to know uh, her first through uh, a process she led over the last year, um, just bringing together, convening, and doing some documenting about people who are exploring using co op models and uh, across the US. She's a master's student at the University of California, Davis, studying local news and cooperative development, and has served as a, an intern at the University of California Cooperative Extension, the Sustainable Economies Law Center, uh, and the Mendocino Voice, all of which are really important innovators in advancing shared ownership models. Uh, Olivia previously worked as a consultant for the Listening Post Collective in California's Central Valley and has worked in communications and community engagement roles uh, with a variety of organizations, including USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism, uh, KALW Public Radio, San Francisco Public Press, and the Institute for Nonprofit News and Mother Jones. And I think you'll see uh, Olivia has a wonderful kind of uh, bird's eye view on a lot of what's going on right now and why these questions are so important. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, just to quickly remind you, Rebecca, they do opening statements before you interview them. Yes? Yeah. Great. So can we hand over now to Javier for your statement? Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation. And please uh, remind me if I'm uh, talking too much, uh, if my time has passed. I will try to, uh, to summarize it the most I can. Um, I think the, the, the main idea or the main proposal I would like to ask here is that uh, I believe that the future of journalism would be uh, self-managed or either way, it won't be uh, journalism at all. And I can say that uh, after my experience, uh, especially as the former president of the Co-op Tiempo Argentino, just a small summarize of, of our experience, Tiempo Argentino was a traditional newspaper in Argentina, uh, but it was a newspaper that was mainly financed. Uh, the, the main revenue source was uh, advertising, and most of that adver advertising was governmental advertising. I mean, uh, in many uh, Latin American countries, uh, governments, states, uh, to be honest, but as you know, states are managed through different administrations, and they uh, probably, I mean, uh, putting the, the, the money in advertisement of their issues. I mean, wh whatever they do in the newspapers, they become year, year over year more and more important in, more and more important in, the, in the sustainability of that uh, the media organization, especially when uh, printed newspapers become uh, being less attractive for people that most of the information that they are getting is from their cell phones. So, uh, newspapers in Argentina that are also the, that were at most uh, the the most trusted source uh, become more and more depending on the government and that of course uh, had incidents had influence in what they report on on issues. Okay, so Tiempo Argentino was one of those newspapers that, but suddenly a change of government made that newspaper to stop receiving money from the government and the owner of that newspaper decided to shut it down. Uh, the workers, the journalists, uh, decided to uh, not to allow that to happen. And we asked our community of readers to support us because as you know, uh, newspapers have different uh, perspectives and maybe you can 
give some information on the government, but you also give all other information. And we had plenty of people that was aware of our situation and that needed the Tiempo Argentino view on the issues. So the first thing that we did was asking people for support. We organized like a, a, a music festival. That music festival was very, very uh, popular. We got a lot of people in that place. A lot of artists also uh, were like very, um, I mean, helped us uh, coming to, uh, to, to this concert we organized. So a lot of people came. Uh, that made us realize that we could uh, do things because a lot of people were interested in our, uh, in our situation. And we decided to give it a go as a co-op. So we created a co-op. We, we fought for the, for the name of the news organization. So we relaunched Tiempo Argentino with a small change in the name. It was Tiempo Argentino, uh, owner of our own words, was the, the new name of the, of, the, of the newspaper. And we launched it with a lot of success. I mean, it was a Monday to Friday newspaper and it became a newspaper that was only printed on, uh, sorry, it was a Monday to Sunday everyday newspaper. We decided to, to, to make a, a change and it became a printed version on Sundays and an online version from Monday to Saturdays. And we asked people for their support becoming members. So Tiempo Argentino in 2016 became the first mem membership organization in Argentina. And it was mainly because uh, we, we had that need. We need people to support us because it was impossible for us uh, to do it in other way. Because as I mentioned before, the new government in Argentina was, it was the Macri administration and was against many of the things that Tiempo Argentino uh, workers uh, and, 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 and journalism was about. Uh, to, to say very, very briefly, it was uh, maybe Macri had a more liberal position and maybe Tiempo Argentino could be more uh, oriented, maybe something like The Guardian, no? Something more with the maybe, uh, as if we don't have a labor party, but maybe you would say that their ideas or the ideas were more uh, similar to those. So it was very difficult for us. We asked for the people to help us and they really came. And uh, okay, that was very, very important. Now we have more than uh, five and a half years, more than 6,000 uh, members. 70% of the income of Tiempo Argentino comes from the readers. Half of that 70% are membership, and the other half is that Sunday edition on the kiosks. And beside that, and that this is the last thing I would say, that Tiempo is not the only thing in Argentina. There are around 11 recovered newspapers. There are maybe the, the fourth uh, newspaper, I mean, digital, digital media in Argentina in terms of audience. It's, a, it's not a co-op, but it's an organization that, that after Tiempo asked people to support them. So that's why I mean that a membership would be the way to support an organization in the future. And in my perspective, as become, becoming a self-managed organization would be the key for legitimate uh, journalism <clears throat> and for confidence in the audience. I mean, that's absolutely fascinating. I loved your opening statement about the future of journalism will be safe managed or it won't be journalism at all. I'm sure we'll be able to te tease those statements out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Olivia. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm here in Sacramento, California, where as Nathan mentioned, I'm a graduate student and Nathan is on my thesis committee and I have a draft due today. So if you see me like slowly lowering a baseball cap over my face during the presentation today, you know why. Um, so I love that Javier started talking about um, sort of governments and how news is funded. Um, so here in the US in the past couple of years, we've seen several federal market-based policy initiatives to address our local news crisis. Um, and last year as the sort of the most likely bill was picking up steam, I was feeling very depressed because it was necessarily going to benefit the worst actors in our news ecosystem, hedge funds, large public corporations, broadcasters that produce low quality news, uh, the peddlers of misinformation. And this was happening out of the desire on the part of the authors um, to be content and entity neutral, to not pick winners and losers. Um, you know, so in the discourse about these bills, 
uh, people often invoked the public good. You know, we're doing this, journalism is a public good, we're doing this in the public good. You know, they'll talk about it in the normative sense of something that's worthy or valuable, but also in that sort of economic sense of a good that's non-excludable, non risk, positive externalities, that kind of thing. So listening to this, all these conversations about this bill, I wondered under what conditions could policy favor a certain type of ownership? Like under what conditions would it be a good idea to like pick a winner in how we design these federal uh, bills that we're talking about? Um, what evidence do we have that community ownership of news, broad-based stakeholder ownership of news um, might be a better vehicle for the public good, this alleged purpose statement for all this policy work? Um, and I'm using Nathan's definition of broad-based stakeholder ownership to mean, you know, firms that are structurally and legally accountable to their uh, most active participants and it's an umbrella term for uh, worker, audience, association, and blended ownership. Um, you know, we really don't have a lot of research that addresses this sector, right? Um, they're excellent sort of case study based papers about newsrooms in Greece and Scotland and Argentina, um, and plus anything you'd care to read about the Associated Press. Um, but this research is a little thin on the ground here in the US where by my count, I think we have like 12 journalism organizations that could be understood as being community owned. So, okay, I don't have a strong research base about which to make claims that community ownership is a better steward of the public good. But I did wanna learn about what other forms of news ownership did, how they did or did not support this meaning of the public good. So uh, I started by wanting to ground this understanding of the public good in folk meanings. You know, I have the dictionary, dictionary definition, but I know what economists say, but how does the phrase get used in media policy? Um, so I did a document review of um, all the ways that people use this term, the public good and discourse around four legislative initiatives. And I found that the language is usually used to describe um, the language that you, that's used to describe the public character of public good character of journalism is like a pretty stable set of themes. It's like extrinsic qualities, like uh, quality and trustworthiness, content types like investigations and like broccoli beets, like it covers the government. It's public good because it covers the government. Um, and then all these public outcomes, like it's a public good because it holds the government accountable. It creates a sense of community and it promotes civic behavior. So I have my list of outcomes associated with the public good. I did a big lit review uh, looking for evidence I could find about the relationship between those things and ownership types. Um, you know, do privately owned newspaper companies tend to create public accountability more than a public corporation or a nonprofit? And unsurprisingly, ownership is not deterministic of much. You know, this sort of makes sense when we think about it, like ownership operates in the context of a business model and its market position the professional culture of the workers and the sort of newsroom production setting. And it's the bigger political system. Javier is describing a totally different media system than we have here in the US. So that's not to say that ownership doesn't influence journalism. It absolutely does in a big way, but the kind of generalized and predictable relationships I was looking for aren't there. And I was also looking at empirical research, which is pretty limited um, in how it draws conclusions. So, but for me, the takeaway is not that a certain ownership type is more or less likely to ensure news as a public good is protected, but that investor ownership and powerful benefactors, whether that's the wealthy owner of a private company, a foundation or a presidential administration pose pretty specific threats um, to these public good attributes of news journalism. So for example, within a very set of narrow historical conditions, the economies of scale afforded by public ownership supported a lot of really high quality news production but public ownership ultimately made newspaper companies in the US more vulnerable to predation by vulture firms when market conditions changed. Julia Caget talks about this, how in moments of history when news firms have needed large amounts of capital, recapitalization um, uh, meant a loss of control. And you know, similar risks are associated with concentrated power and wealth um, in other ownership types, including public media and nonprofit media. Um, so to me, the promise of community ownership as a strong steward of news as public good lies in three areas. One is its potential to separate political control from the significant capital we need to produce high quality news. The second is the potential for democratically managed associations of newsrooms to achieve economies of scale without sacrificing the control of their core work. And the third is the potential for community ownership of news to embrace engagement as its core operating principle, not only as a participatory approach to 
you know, reporting the news, but as an operational practice to finance the organization, shape its policies, and make long-term plans. Thank you. Olivia, we could have those three points a whole separate seminars, couldn't we? <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so we can, we can move to the interview phase now. So um, not sure who, how you want to do this, Nathan and Rebecca, but um, we've got fif about 15 minutes for this. Rebecca, do you have a, a place to begin or would you like me to begin? I'd really like to talk more about the politics, I think, because I think wherever you are in the world right now, politics is a huge part of the changes that are happening or not happening. Um, so I wonder if both of you could potentially start by talking about that, about um, you know that separation between the politics and, and the news production, and, and actually how the communities in which that production is happening are influenced by the politics, which in then turn influences the funding and the, the ideas around the, the, the news that's being produced in the place it is. Um, well, yeah, um, you know, Rafael Groman talks about this in his paper about Tiempo Argentina, about um, how I, my understanding there is that a lot of sort of uh, self-managed newsrooms there are driven from a place of like the world of work, about like labor rights, worker rights, worker power. And then here in the United States, and maybe in the UK, the logics of it are sort of about sort of production logics. We think co-ops are sort of more financially resilient and it, you know, um, it serves the community better and it makes, it makes better journalism. It's maybe more of like a produ capitalist production logic that really sort of pervades our conversations about news here in the US and even news co-ops. Um, and in part that's sort of reflected in our policy making about how to solve the news crisis. It's very market-based, um, you know, very regulation Averse government averse. I I would say that uh, as as Olivia mentioned, I mean in Argentina we have a long tradition on on co-ops and 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 being a co-op is also uh, taking part of a certain certain type of of ideology in in, in terms of of labor and, and and okay it's a it's a political position here also. Uh, and it's not the, that usual. We, you, we used to have co-ops that were related to, to provi providing services like, uh, um, for example, uh, audiovisual TV or, or cable TV or things like that in small, uh, in small towns, but, it, but they are not anymore like big national co-ops in Argentina. That is not uh, what we are in Tiempo Argentina. It's a, what we call a recovered uh, co-op. You know, we were formerly a um, uh, a private company and we became a co-op. And what I would say is that in our case, uh, a co-op, I mean, we don't have also, we, we are not a community ownership organization. Uh, the owners of Tiempo Argentino are the workers of Tiempo Argentino. And when I'm talking about members are people that are, uh, it's kind of subscribers, but, but it's not the same relationship that we have. It's like, a, it's an engagement relationship, much more important. We, we, we talk a lot with our audience. I mean, it's not the New York Times relationship with the subscribers. It's much more uh, close, but it's not a community ownership. Our readers are not owners of the Argentino, just the workers. So uh, our, our relationship is really uh, transparent. And I think that the most important issue of that is um, uh, legitimacy. I think that trust uh, today, it's very, very important for news organizations and being a co-op and being uh, financially independent from the government put us in a place that allow us to say a lot of things that I knew South that can't say. And that's a political position and that makes Tiempo Argentino independent really from, the, from, the, from politics and that's, a lot of a lot to say in Argentina these days, and I think in Latin America. So I would say that uh, being in a in a co-op news outlet is uh, also something very important. That that's why I was saying before that journalism in the future would be self-managed because it's I think the the most uh, uh, the most real or 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 or, or credible way of being independent today uh, as a journalist. Javier, can I say that's so fascinating that you talked that you said that being a co-op supports and it's perceived to support trust in you and independence. And um, I have been uh, 
It was shared with me a survey that was done at a newsroom thinking about converting into a co-op. And many of their me existing members said, this is a terrible idea. It's gonna make you less independent. Um, out of a fear that somehow like the political influences of, of um, sort of community owners would, um, would hurt the organization. Whereas that newsroom is currently funded by advertisers and philanthropy and foundations. Um, very fascinating. I just wanted to mention that. I, mean, I would say in my case that uh, why, why I say that and why, why I, I feel the opposite. I mean, you, you have to understand that Tiempo Argentino is not something that uh, we created from nothing. It was something that it was developed out of the shutdown of a newspaper. So we start doing things and things start happening. It's not something that we plan and, okay, we are going to do this. So maybe if you ask Tiempo Argentino workers before, if you would like to create a co-op, they would have said no. We don't want to do that. We want someone to pay our salaries at the end of the month, and that's all. I want to be involved in my job. It's this is a job, you know. Uh, but we realize that it's not like that. And 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 in the past, we couldn't do some articles because uh, the one advertiser was the main advertiser, so we couldn't talk about, for example, um, uh, soy in Argentina. The production of soy in Argentina it's using a lot of transgenic, and it's doing a lot of harm to the population. And we couldn't write an article. If you look from 2010 to 2016, there you won't find any article about soy and the way of production of soy in Argentina. From 2016 until today, Tiempo Argentino has been the, mo the, 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 the newspaper that publishes the most amount of articles about that. And, and that is the legitimacy I was talking about. And that is why maybe people, when, when gets uh, annoyed with Tiempo Argentino because of what is publishing, they write us an article, I'm going to stop uh, stop paying or, or supporting you. And we say, okay, but we are not, we don't want to create uh, an article uh, because our supporters say that. Uh, and the thing is that when every time we do that, we recover that 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 person that was annoyed with us. And, and we had, now we have more presence, now we are more uh, acknowledged in society because of our positions. So it's not something that you could have said before doing Tiempo Argentino, but this is something that we can say after uh, being a call. And that's my experience. I'm not saying that everyone and every place is the same. I know that uh, New York Times has published two different uh, front pages because once they publish one front page, a lot of people start complaining, so they stop. Uh, printing and did another one. I mean, I understand that risk, but I believe that uh, there are much more benefits than, 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 than risk in that sense. Great. One thing I, I wanted to ask you both about is, is whether journalism is, is a special business in the sense that, um, in two senses. One, you know, does it need to be treated differently by the society as a whole, by policy, um, you know, do we need to, uh, uh, you know, you, you said a lot, um, Olivia, about public goods. Do we need to um, regard this as a, an industry requiring special treatment um, by, by policy, by, you know, culture, all sorts of things? Um, and then second, in the context of the cooperative models, is this something that needs to be structured differently than other kinds of cooperatives? Are there ways in which, in which, we can't just apply the same lessons that we've applied in other cooperative contexts to the news, um, perhaps because it is, you know, different in 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 um, uh, some of the, you know, in some kind of general fashion. Javier, why don't you go first? Um, I mean. What, what we found here in Argentina, as I mentioned, uh, I'm talking mainly about our experience. We had previously the tradition of, of recovery co-ops. And what we found being the first media organization as a recovery co-op is that uh, laws wouldn't comply to us. Uh, because, uh, for example, we, we live in an industry where in Argentina we have just one uh, paper plant that provides the, that source. And, and that was, and that became very, very important for us. And that key issue, for example, was there, there are a few subsidies for organizations, but for example, we couldn't use that kind of subsidies to 
by uh, paper, or um, for example, we couldn't. Uh, there, there were some kind of subsidies that that, that were related to uh, metal uh, enterprises or other kind of productions, and it was not something that that it's like uh, how do you say uh, something more. It's not creative, but uh, another kind of 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 woods you need to produce to produce this. You need maybe computers, and that's all. And 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 so there were a few things that uh, has to be changed in our policies, in Argentinian policies, in order to include this kind of uh, this, this kind of enterprises. So, but besides that, I would say that that there is nothing special about it. I would say that there is like a some kind of, of feeling among journalists that we are something different from the rest, that we are kind of artists or, or intellectuals, but we are just as workers as any other uh, branch. And, and I would say that the most important thing for journalists is to understand themselves as uh, workers and, and, to, and to be empathic with the people that has similar situations. And maybe because they are not like, uh, workers of their minds or whatever something uh, someone believes they are. Uh, I think you have to be much more humiled and, and nothing special should be made for journalists at all. You know, I think that um, that, that journalism is special as like a core myth to the, you know, in the United States, you know, like um, it's sort of what we believe sort of keeps our democracy accountable. So no matter what I believe personally, it is sort of a, a foundational ideology that it is a special thing that happens. Um, and yet, you know, our, our political system doesn't treat it that way in terms of subsidies or anything like that. It's like, it's, it's very contradictory. It's like, this is the fourth estate, this is the fourth branch of government, but we're just gonna leave it to the market to sort of divide, divide things up. But, um, so I don't know if it truly matters what I think, um, given the power of that myth. Um, and then sort of in like, your second question was about like types of forms um, for, for news co-ops, right? Like can forms of co-ops used in other industries, you know, just as easily be applied in this context? Um, I don't know. I mean, they, they, they've they designed it that way. Um, you know, the Brickhouse co-op sort of took their bylaws pretty closely from an electric co-op. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I do think that this question about um, editorial independence is something that people ask me a lot about. Like, well, okay, worker ownership, community ownership, does not hurt your editorial independence. And when I read bylaws of co-ops, bylaws tend to not sort of like, um, proactively state rights. It's it's sort of it's sort of like okay, hey, here's what you can do, not here's what you shouldn't do. Um, so so certainly whatever you know, news co-op should find a way to sort of better articulate either in their bylaws or in sort of how they communicate about themselves publicly, sort of how that how that piece about editorial independence works. That's all I can think of. Thank you. I I think it's striking that both of you. Um, uh, you know, call into question this this specialness that is often um, you know is often attributed to this um, uh, to the to this industry, and you know, call for uh, uh, recognizing it as you know part of a bigger picture. Thank you, uh, Nathan. I would add something to that. I mean, uh, something that it was. Uh, I mean, when we started Tiempo Argentino, we asked other uh, co-ops to provide us with their um, bylaws because we didn't. I mean. No one in Tiempo Argentino was a specialist in co-op. We, we just happened to, to, to meet co-op in the, in the process uh, of the recovery of the, of the news organization. And we realized two things about that. Uh, one was that we couldn't copy paste the bylaw because there were some specific issues. And the other one was that it was very important for us that we uh, some kind of split what is like organizing and another thing is that the editorial uh, process, you know? So the director of the newspaper is not the president of the co-op. And, and, and having that clear, and having that clear that the president couldn't change the, a title of the, of the, 
cover of the newspaper was very, very important. And at the beginning, it was a little confusing, you know, and because uh, how do we do? Should we vote for the for the for the director? Should we? And and, and I mean, we we decided to to make like open sessions about that to discuss that openly. Uh, and finally, uh, we decided to to establish uh, a kind of, of of rule where organization of the co-op was one thing, and the editorial line was another thing. The the co-op we had uh, a voting process every year, and for the other thing, we could say, okay, we would see uh, in, in the process how do we make the changes in that uh, situation but for example we don't have any in our bylaws uh, a way to decide who's the director of the organization it's something that maybe we we solve that in, in in assemblies or things like that that may be specific for a newspaper compared to other kind of uh, industries for example but but nathan you talk about in new you know in your New Deal paper about maybe the need for sort of a, a general purpose legal entity type for all kinds of sort of types of community ownership that you know could potentially include journalism organizations. So I wanted to throw that out. And the cool thing about Julia Cage talking about the nonprofit media organization is, is that it, it allows for um, you know, foundations, at least here in the US, um, uh, tend to get a lot of money because they're tax shelters for wealthy people. Um, so that nonprofit media organization concept also provides a lot of a lot of benefits about ways to get and keep capital, but separating it from sort of voting rights and political control. So we'll, we'll figure it out. We certainly win. And to, to help us figure out, we're now going to go into our breakout rooms. So uh, Rory, can you do the honors? And so uh, I'm gonna go into I'll, uh, so just to a reminder, Nathan, Olivier, Rebecca, Javier, if you decline the invitation, but I'm going to create two breakout rooms for the rest of you, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that they're evenly balanced, okay? You'll have 20 minutes in your breakout room, and then we're interested in, in your free comments when you come back. So um, Nathan and Rebecca will have a conversation with those of you who've been in, in the breakout rooms rather than the panellists when you come back for 20 minutes, okay? Um, I, I was interested in the, the conversation around ownership that you were having. Um, it sounds to me like, because uh, I think, Rebecca, you're, you're, you're wholly a, a reader owned, aren't you? Yeah, so, yeah. So I was it, really interested about this as well, because yeah, one of so, my questions I was going to ask was around like do you think actually worker-owned media or community-owned media is, is stronger and which has the most legitimacy uh, and I guess the reason I asked that is because Olivia's point about that survey is fascinating uh, about being that that much more independent and I guess it's part of that goes into the kind of the global perception of what a co-op is and how it's managed as well because I'm so one of my colleagues Anka some of you may know her is, is from Romania and, you know, she always says how in a lot of Eastern Europe, you can't talk about co-ops because co-ops are a dirty word because they're associated with communism and forced collectivization. Whereas actually in the UK, the perspective of the US is that a lot of these large agricultural co-ops are very right wing, that they're, they're very, um, very much a small group of people looking after their own self-interest. So it's interesting to see how that perception can, can then be applied and filtered onto the idea of of, of, uh, of news co-ops and media co-ops, because as Rory said, we are wholly reader own so none of the well, colleagues can be members if they want to be but the actual ownership comes down to the um to the readers and the members but ours goes a slightly different um down a slightly different path as well because Com news was founded 150 years ago by the retail societies by you know by the cooperative shops in the uk and the problem we've got there is at the peak there are about 1200 1400 individual society owners um, and now there's 18 and all those members have like taken each other over and combined. So actually a huge amount of our members, therefore our subscribers, therefore our owners, therefore our income is concentrated in a small group of organizations rather than a, a, a wider range of individual members, which is the route we're trying to go down. But actually it's quite hard because so much of our funding is tied up in, in, in these organizations, although we are, a, you know, a full cooperative with, with full editorial control and independence. Which is a whole other story, but yeah, I'd really like to hear your hear your thoughts and more about that. Yeah, just to build on it, I'm just wondering if if because it sounds like you you've got more experience of Javier worker owned uh, 
news outlets and Olivia it sounds like yours is more community owned which seemed to imply more of a user model but have you got any experience where more than one stakeholder group has a role in governance or is there a role for a, for more than one stakeholder group in the governance of your media outlets maybe not through ownership but through some other form well and I wanted to clarify that I use community ownership in a way that encompasses workers um, and like forms of employee and multi-stakeholder ownership. So um, it, in fact, I am, um, you know, we have in the U.S., when you, when you talk about co-ops, people also go, oh, the, new, the food co-op. Consumer cooperatives tend to not allow, many of them don't allow workers on the board. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my local food co-op, I try, I write letters, I try to join committees, they don't let me join them to try to like encourage um, employee representation on the board and you can't do it. Um, so I, I, I strongly believe that, um, you know, worker and multi-stakeholder forms, um, you know, protect that critical aspect of like worker, worker mm -hmm. governance. So when I say community ownership, I mean, big, big 10. Yeah. Okay. In the recovered company movement, is there any, are there any, uh, multi-stakeholder you said, cause you mentioned there were 10 other publishers, Xavier, Javier. Yes, in case of, of journalism, uh, they are pretty much all the same. Uh, so it's like the, the workers create the co-op and, and they ask for uh, readers to support them. Uh, but of course we have consumers co-op and, and mainly in, in, in local, I mean, in local areas, not in, in the big cities. Uh, for example, in Buenos Aires, you won't find big co-ops. Maybe you would have, you would find small ones uh, providing some things, but not not uh, supermarkets, you won't find uh, uh, water supply, or, uh, that, that would, that would, you would find it in, in, the, in the rest of Argentina, but not in, in the big uh, capital cities. In publishing, do you just have the, the worker-owned model? Yeah. 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 Okay. But you talked about a, a new form of engagement um, that seemed to be different to traditional media. So how, how does that work? I mean, it's uh, what do we do? It's or we organize. Well, we had some kind of benefits for 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 members, and those benefits in, imply like main cultural uh, things, and and people come to the news organization to get their tickets. They we we talk to them. They always are taking pictures. They are sending the pictures. We have like a social page in the webs in in our news uh, newspaper. So we are constantly like having dialogue with them. We organize surveys for them. And in, in relation with the, with the answer of that, of that survey, we, we write articles. Uh, for example, when we, we, we won a GNI uh, grant to, to, to further develop our website, and we ask for uh, readers to become our like testers. So they, they came uh, to be part of the process of rebuilding the website. It's it's something that we we create and 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 somehow what, what I would add in terms of our internal survey, uh, we made an, an internal survey to our uh, members and we asked them why they became members of Tiempo Argentina, and the the first reason I mean the number one was because I want to support a self managed organization. Mm -hmm. Then in the second term it was like because of the of the agenda that you do so it, it was not. Uh, the, the the journalism the first one it was like supporting us a, a self-managed uh, entrepreneur no then it was the agenda uh and the third one was because i knew someone that was involved with the car you know so it's it's like something that it's spreading somehow mm -hmm. and, and, it's and interesting in the yeah oh, sorry go ahead. go ahead olivia oh i was just quickly gonna say the piece about consumer ownership has particular relevance in the US because of um, like reasons about financing and getting money for the co-op because we have such a anyway the state of it is so rough here in terms of revenue um, yeah I'll just say that's a big reason why people sort of pitch consumer cooperative models here in the US and and what we're seeing on that point uh, both in the US and the and the UK is these models where you're where you're um, maybe you have a different primary ownership structure that might be worker ownership, or it might be a more kind of conventional family or something ownership. Um, but then you're doing an equity crowdfunding or community share round, right? And you're, um, 
uh, and and so a chunk of your cap table becomes um, community owned. Um, but you know, in in a lot of these cases, because they're designed around the logic of investment rounds, um, it's very temporal. So mm. you, know, you might have done a round five years ago, and those investors from five years ago are still co-owners. Um, maybe a quarter of them no longer read it. And, um, and twice as many people are reading it now who are not co-owners, right? And so we're ending up with some, some pretty kind of odd models in terms of um, building community ownership around, around financing that you know, doesn't, I think, fit super well with the kind of what we tend to think of in terms of membership of a, of a news organization. Uh, uh, in the way that, that Javier was, t was talking about there. And so it does, you know, seem to suggest in some respects ways in which, you know, this is not just an investment in, that you might make in, in another sense, but, you know, needs, needs a, something where we can align that membership relationship with, uh, with the ownership uh, uh, and investment relationship. I would say one thing, and sorry, Mary, I know that... Yeah, Mary's got a hand up. <laughs> Just one small thing, because I mean, uh, as you know, I, I'm actually currently like a, a membership uh, responsible of, of El Diario R, and, and I am also doing some consultancy on membership. And when we talk about membership, we are talking about this kind of emotional relationship uh, between the reader and the and the news organization. And the main difference with a subscriber, it's it's mainly that. If you, I mean, if you're a subscriber, if you, you need to pay to consume something, uh, while while you are a member, uh, things are. I mean, the, the, the journeys that we produce, it's free for everyone, uh, but members support them, and and that's maybe the main, the, the most important issue. I mean, you are doing something that it's much more than uh, than doing something for someone. You are doing something for the society, and people wants to join that, and that's that's the. The bond that, that it's being created there. Yeah. Sorry, Mary. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I I just want to have I have a question really, and I really found the presentations this afternoon really interesting because it's all very new to me in terms of looking at publishing um, and worker owned and uh, community owned media, and um, and I'm just wondering, um, Javier, just in terms of just as you've described it about people subscribing it and, be, and new members, it's almost like another movement. And I'm wondering how your political regime um, respond to uh, a, you know, a, a recovered company like yourself that have are, are now self-financing, but obviously pursuing a, a particular agenda um, and how that might uh, come up against kind of political will and, and how, how how you as a how you as a business? What your future? You see your future as? When when we first launched in two thousand and sixteen, it was quite difficult because, as I mentioned, the the, the, the government that was in administ the administration at that time was mainly supporting another kind of uh, ideas, uh, ideological ideas, and we suffered from it a lot. Uh, <laughs> even more, we had an attack on our newsroom. Uh, Three or four months after we launched the the newspaper, they got into it. They start breaking our computers, and we think it was with uh, at least the uh, the acknowledgement of the government that they decide not to do anything, you know. And and they they get free all the we 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 force the police to intervene, and the police uh, stop the guys from breaking everything, but then release them, you know. And 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 the the justice still hasn't done anything. We have five years from that and nothing happened. So it was quite difficult, but you have to say something that is very important for me to, 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 to mention. In Argentina, we really have, uh, I mean, taking out that this, uh, this episode, we really have, uh, I mean, freedom of speech here. So uh, that kind of aggression uh, did more for Tiempo Argentino than for the government. Yeah, uh, people. I mean, we had like two main moments in which people became member of Tiempo Argentino. Once the, the first one was when we launched, and the second one was when we were attacked. And and after that, we we create a momentum on that. Mm -hmm. All the all the all the journalists in Argentina made also their their uh, state statements about this, 
lot of people, we made a special edition and it was, and it ran out and all the, the newsrooms uh, took pictures with the, with the newspaper, like saying, we support that. So uh, I think that uh, we had that at that time and it was very important that how everyone reacted. But after that, uh, I think things were very good for us and for the rest of the news co-op organizations. Right. That's, that's really interesting. I'm just wondering how, I mean, you meant, it sounds like you're all in, in a, you've got a group of you in an office. Um, given the state of current technology, can you, cre can you create a distributed, effectively a distributed production co-op of news for news media? Because I imagine you're, many of you are home based at Co-op News, are you now, Rebecca, is that right? Excuse me. Yes, we are at the moment. Um, so we've kept our registered address as the same building. So in, in Manchester, in the UK, where we're based, it's kind of a, a co-op quarter where there's lots of co-op organisations in the mm. same same area. So our office has for a long time been in the same building. It's called Holy Oak House and it's where Co-ops UK are, it's where the Co-op College is based, it's where the Heritage Trust is based. So at the, our lease ended in last December. So we decided to move out um, because we hadn't used it for, for nearly a year. Um, so we're all working from home at the moment. It's still our registered address. We've still got storage there. We still use it as a meeting point. But to be honest, we are thinking about potentially moving back um, or at least taking a small space where if people want to go in and work that they can. Um, our situation is, is quite unique. So we're, we're a team of five. Um, so three of us have caring responsibilities of various types and, and um, severity. And then the other two, one person is very happy working from home um, but, but would quite happily come in. And the person is desperate to not be at home any longer. So it's, it's trying to balance the needs of everybody, uh, the finances uh, and the, the ability to make sure everyone is safe and secure in COVID as well. So what about you, Olivia and Javier? Are your organisations, how distributed or centralised are they in terms of physical location? And, and would that provide you with extra resilience against the kind of attacks that the police were responsible for in Argentina? In our case, we, we had one newsroom. Uh, at that time, we were like uh, <laughs> occupying uh, the, the, the newsroom of the private organisation. Okay. Uh, that uh, held the newspaper and now we moved to another place and that's the centralized place but uh, after the once the pandemic got here oh. we kind of distributed everything and and we have like our newsroom there uh, that it's half full once a week and most of the work is now like spread uh, and it's uh, home office most of the things are not home office but i mean people are working from their places the congress or whatever Okay. And I'm, you know, I'm just a little graduate student, so I don't know much about other sort of cooperative newsrooms in the US. But, um, you know, I think I mentioned in our prep meeting that sort of our most high profile sort of consumer news cooperative, um, you know, laid off all its staff unexpectedly a couple of weeks ago. Um, mm. And uh, it's actually proved to be, for me, slightly inspiring because um, hundreds of people who were member owners of that news organization are going through the bylaws being like, yes. oh, maybe I should have been consulted here. Hmm, yes. you know, why wasn't I asked about this? Or like, you know, um, truly getting into the details about like how it works and their, and why didn't you come to us and ask for more money? We would have helped you. We didn't know the finances were this bad. Did I get a financial report at the last annual meeting? Like, wow, hundreds of people. Um, that level of sense of ownership and responsibility for that news organization, not only sort of normatively, like I love it, but like I was ready to give you more money. Um, it, will that turn it around, do you think? You know, they, they, um, uh, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> I think that they have only like two remaining board members. And um, right. I mean, there's a lot of sense of crisis about it, but mm. I think it is a pretty powerful testament. And Nathan has talked about this, that maybe the power of those sort of consumer models are that when things go bad, they fall apart maybe in a better way. Um, you know, that that news organization can't be sold to a hedge fund without a vote of the membership, um, yeah. Yeah. you know? So it, it's actually, I think, kind of an inspiring case and a, and a, and a case for consumer ownership models, yeah. or at least partially. We're, we're going to have to readmit them in a moment, but I mean, I, 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 I appreciate, you know, multi-staker organizations can pose specific problems but they they 
at least theoretically, they can defend themselves uh, against what those kind of things that happen. You know, you, you can't have a group of workers who can take a decision like that without also having the consent of the readers. Uh, and the readers can't take a decision to just to shut down the workers' jobs as well. So the, there's arguments for multi-stakeholding um, that it, it, we talked in the last session about building an ecosystem rather than just uh, a business model. And it seems to me that multi-stakeholding is more conducive to building ecosystems. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see where we go from here. But it's, it sounds like it's very early days in this. Uh, right, that's my reminder to ad readmit everyone. Um, Rory, who is in each room? Do you know? Yep, yeah, I'll tell you. So in the first room, we've got Gillian, Martin and Roger. That's Gillian Lonergan, Martin Metiard and Roger Spear. And in the second one, we've got Catalina and Rothio, who I know have both got to go at five o'clock. Um, so it looks like we lost somebody from that room and they may not be able to stay much longer. So it might just be Martin, Gillian and Roger that we're having most of our conversation. Okay. <laughs> well, should we just start by asking room two? Uh, yeah, for... ask room two very quickly first, I think, and then we we'll move on to room one, yeah. Do you want to do that, Nathan, or do you want me to? Happy to. It's always interesting how often in public events people stay until the last minute when they get kicked booted out of their rooms. But I find in my in my classes people rush out of the rooms as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, Behavior is different. All right, as we're are Kathleen, we all back now. Yeah, Rothy and okay, Catalina, great. we've realized we must ask you your your feedback first because you, I, I think you've both got well, to go. Haven't well, you? in, well. In, well, Rocio, Rocio has, you know, written everything, but just one word from, I think, from all the conversation that we had, it was this infotoxic and how we can, you know, tackle that. That's all. It has been a great, uh, um, um, you know, session and see you uh, someday. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. My dear. Yeah, so so the two of us saw, saw each other. Grant was also there, but the mic is down. So we just started chatting in Spanish and we were like, so it was quite intense. But yes, a, a few thoughts eh, that I'm sharing with you. Uh, the first one has to do with um, uh, the, this idea, you know, that there's some there's an initiative here in Spain that is called El Salto. Um, and what they're doing right now is that, and really, 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 this is so important, instead of talking about multiculturality and everything, we are seeing the process, the whole process in journalism. So what they're doing is that they are having sections in, in, the, in the regional languages. So you have Galician, Basque, uh, Valenciano, and Catalan uh, in El Salto. And that way, I mean, what they're doing is one, normalizing languages, which in Spain was like, oh, those are not really languages. So they're normalizing it. And two, they're also relating to the stories that care, yeah, that the people in the, in the regions care about. So, so we're really sort of practicing interculturality and not just talking about multiculturality, which doesn't mean anything. Um, the second one has to do with um, memory. The role of journalism to, to keep the memory, the citizen-based uh, uh, memory and the fights. And, and you know, Spain has a long history of hidden uh, you know, and forgotten uh, 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 sort of processes, social uh, processes of recognition and, 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 and sort of that have to take place and will never happen, but how this citizen-based journalism, meaning cooperative journalism, eh, uh, is, is pointing at the topics and the themes that have been systematically forgotten by the, the journal, the mass media. I mean, that's something huge in, I would say in all countries, because there are topics that not only, not only the political sort of um, uh, themes that you cannot talk about that Javier was mentioning, you know, the, the big uh, agro industry that uses fertilizers that you cannot, but, but even in history, one, and the second one has to do with the follow-up of news. I mean, what happens with the news all of a sudden fades away from the spotlight of, of uh, the mass media, but that is crucial for the lives of communities. So cooperative uh, journalism is, is certainly doing that, but of course that's not a sailing point in the in the market. Um, th then also this idea of, of citizen-based journalism, how how we how they can live together, you know, cooperative 
uh, journalism and uh, citizen-based journalism, there has to be a way to integrate them. And we know that some citizen-based journalism, it's crap. I mean, it's being recorded, sorry. But uh, some <laughs> other, it's actually a way of giving voice to, to these communities who do have stories to tell. And actually, some of them know how to do it, you know? So, so these, and, and then also when you talk about social media, I mean, how, how citizens are using it, it can be toxic. But then for instance, when you think about the Peru elections, this time around, people in Peru learn what a fraud, what a, a, a transparent campaign, what the rights were, because there were journalists through the social media doing that, you know, and many of them actually belong to, to cooperative uh, uh, journalists. Um, then another thing, the value, of, of, of the profession of journalism, you know, of, of the journalist. Actually, in these cooperative uh, journals, what you're seeing is that some of them are coming back. Some of the professions in journalism that we thought were gone, like photo editors, uh, photo journalists, they're coming back because because we do understand that writing a story is not just spitting words, but really conceiving a, a story from the origins and the projection into the future, you know? So, um, and then what else? Oh, and then this idea, you know, that uh, the, the journalists that you see in this kind of, of uh, uh, platforms of, of organizations, it really digs into the complexity of society. It's not just presenting a dualistic approach, but it's really digging into the complexity and it's more about informing rather than provoking a reaction that many times you feel that's what mass media do. So that was our chatting. Thank you so much. That What, what an incredible set of, of reflections. Um, panelists, do you have any, any thoughts you wanna, you wanna bounce off of those, those ideas? Well, when you talked about language, I wanted to mention, maybe you've heard of it that, um, the largest group of French language newspapers in Quebec um, was going through a bankruptcy proceeding and they were sort of saved by the government, you know, converted to employee ownership. It, you know, it just, you know, clearly language diversity is very important in Quebec in a way it's not maybe important here in the US, but that reminded me of that case. And the other thing I wanted to mention is about memory, to, which to me brings up a really important issue of copyright, at least here in the US, um, uh, sort of the privatization of information and particularly the use of metered paywalls to keep, you know, to keep you out, um, yeah. you know, fee based access to news articles um, is something that certainly cooperatives could seek to address and that Maria Bustillos, who's involved with um, uh, uh, an association co-op here in the US is really interested in that stuff. So you've got my mind going. Interesting. I, I would just add that, that all the items that, that uh, Rocio mentioned uh, about memory, about language, about following up uh, certain stories, uh, the value of, of professional journalism and stuff, pretty much comes with the idea that I was saying that the future of journalism would be managed in terms of uh, there is a revalorization of, of, of issues. And, and I think that most of that revalorization has to do that, I mean, we are doing this by our, by our own means. We have to do what we feel is right. We are not doing this just as a regular job. It's something that, that, that we are making our sacrifice to organize and uh, it's not any other kind of stuff. So we are trying to do it the best. And, and I think that what Rocio mentions uh, shows somehow uh, that idea. Well, fantastic ideas. I'd um, like to hear from other participants and from, from other uh, from the other breakup group, do you uh, have a, a bit of a report to share? Well, maybe I'll kick off and then Roger, and it was an all UK group, myself, Roger and uh, Gillian. So maybe we discussed obviously a lot about <laughs> examples in the UK and so on. So uh, Roger and Gillian, I'm sure will want to chip in. Just to say, we did first of all also talk about the what the role is of citizen journalists, you know, like all major news media from the BBC downwards, all encourage people to submit their news and comments and, and whatever. But the editorial control obviously remains firmly within the, uh, uh, the ownership of that media and the control uh, of that media. Um, 
I suppose the other thing that we talked about was the extent to which, uh, and we talked a bit about the, because from Gillian, is an, we have, Gillian is an expert about the past role of court news and how people submitted, uh, society submitted articles to court news and court news was, was sold in court shops and all this history of, that doesn't really interest in what it, The other thing though was, no, sorry, one more thing. Also, we looked at there's a couple of magazines in the UK, in particular, New Internationalist, which was a worker cooperative, um, which in fact has now done, I think, two community share issues to raise funds from primarily readers who would also become reader owners, but has a shared model in terms of governance, uh, appointments to the board and so on. Um, but the other thing, I suppose, was to look at more broadly than print journalism uh, and to look at other forms of media. Uh, one I'm particularly uh, know about is, is a, a group called Navara Media who use YouTube to broadcast. They do broadcasts every Monday, Wednesday and Friday night, but they also do alerts if there are news stories. They do quite a wide range of uh, interviews. I mean, it is all from a left perspective. Um, but every, <laughs> whatever media may say, there is always some kind of, or almost always some kind of editorial bias in there and certainly has always been in terms of, of UK media. So we were interested in like whether court news might go into <laughs> YouTube broadcasting or whether there are other opportunities there, but to look at the shift away from print journalism towards other forms of media, which wasn't really discussed in the opening session. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I would love to do that. If I had all the, all the time and money and colleagues, and that, that'd be great. I'll tell you who is doing that, which is really interesting, is Argentina, isn't it? Is, is Cooper R doing it? It's coop.tv, um, I, I think. I know Ariel Guarco is involved. So Ariel, I'm sure most of you know him. He's the president of the, the ICA based in Argentina. And yeah, there's a thing called coop.tv, coop I think, based that the, the apex body in um, Argentina is doing. Um, it's all in Spanish. My Spanish is is terrible <laughs> so I've, I've watched a little bit of it and it, it looks fairly slick it, it, it's really interesting i'd be very interested to see what the what the editorial process is is, is behind that um one other thing i'd like to like comment on is, is what you were talking about martin about the you know the role of cult news and you know what what the purpose of it is one of some of my favorite things to do in my in my, in my current job is, is go into the archive and look through past issues of cult news because they are fascinating absolutely fascinating and it, it's not just people submitting articles there's there's fiction in there there's a, there's a health column there's a medical column where people always submit their, their their ailments and they get told to put olive oil in their ear most of the time and it, it's absolutely hilarious and brilliant but i think what that really illustrates is that there used to be you know, a whole service publication for the whole movement in a way that the co-op in the UK, at least, again, was a whole service movement. You know, for the, for the co-op group and the retail societies, it was from the cradle to the grave. You know, they provide everything, you know, from milk and dairy and they had farms and they had the retail societies and they had the funeral care and they had the pharmacies and everything else in between. So it was very much a, a community wide um, initiative no, it wasn't just just a shop and it wasn't just a newspaper it wasn't just a a, a single business it's a whole culture of, around you know around especially in the north of england those smaller communities that, that, that grew out of that so i guess like it, it kind of it's very very reflective of what what's happening to to national and international media today and you know the changing role that that plays and how people consume and and produce their own news and become their own arbitrators of that that was a ramble. Mm -hmm. you, are you, Roger, you got, you got anything you want to add? Um, yeah, well, the, we did talk about quite a few things in in our group. The, I mean, the, touching on the, the last point uh, Rebecca made, um, the the sort of the Facebook uh, challenge, if you like, um, is is quite an interesting one about you know mo moving through self-managed moving to one extreme of the self-managed journalism um where you know all kinds of all kinds of qualities of, of news are shared within a, a social network and within the social social media and uh and and you know there's an increasing level of plural, pluralism that, I mean, Martin mentioned the 
the the mix between print and and dig, digital and and multimedia and, and so on but the the plural the challenge of pluralism where we don't kind of share anything um mm. you know we we supposedly i still watch the bbc quite a bit in in this country but uh, um you know the issue of, about the extent to which we can trust um an increasingly diverse and, and pluralistic media i think is is quite a big one and and also the you know is there a way in which um you know some form of um cooperative co curation can um be layered onto social media i don't know i mean i think that is that's a a, a big challenge mm -hmm. of you know the validity of news is is a big challenge and, so, and quite often cooperatives uh, come in when there's a sort of there's a major issue eth ethical or, or market failure but no answers i'm afraid <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think it's a great thought and you know i'm curious about you know whether how it might play across the um you know the spanish context as well as is you know we've been talking about newsrooms um but you know the conversation touches on publishing more broadly and does uh you know for instance i'm curious if if anybody's seen um uh some of these outlets uh not only produce news but also get involved in helping to structure conversations in creating social spaces and creating spaces of of interactivity i mean we've seen a lot of the um a lot of emerging news outlets um uh come out of social communities you know you might start with just a you know a, a social social media account and then it kind of grows into an entire newsroom um you know are you seeing attention to the space of the social and i i just want to emphasize the fact that you know in previous generations the competitive advantage of cooperatives was creating lateral relationships among members so much mm. um and and building on the social capital of relationship um, and I worry in not just in journalism, but in finance and all sorts of other cooperative sectors that we've seeded um, that that kind of practice to 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 capitalist businesses. And we're no longer even in our cooperatives leveraging the power of lateral social relationships. Is anybody um, seeing those? Yeah, well, um, well Darren, Darren's not here. For, he was here in the first half on, on platform co-ops. He's found some very interesting uh, platforms for learning, um, one of which um, either when people are broadcasting live or when they're putting out a pre-recorded broadcast, the, there's a whole community of people who sort of do live, live chat discussing and debating what is, what is being said in the video. And that's that's like a learning model that they they have these set piece videos that go up there, and the learning experience is from debating and discussing what is what is being broadcast. Um, and that is a lot. He said it's a lot more interactive than than many of the other platforms. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's something similar. I suppose you do live broadcasting on YouTube. You can do live broadcasting on Google and fa even Facebook now, where people make you know. They can push their thumbs and their hearts and stuff, but it's not it's not really a debate uh, in the way that he he was reporting this happens on the teaching platform. I, I did have one query. We're sort of um, into the last fifteen minutes. Uh, I thought Nathan, you were involved in in the the campaign around Twitter we, uh, some while back. Um, just those of you, I, th I don't know if you all remember that there was a, a moment when. Um, the idea of trying to convert Twitter into a, a user cooperative, as it were, seemed to be on the agenda. And I think you got it into the general meeting of Twitter for discussion, even though it got voted down. But I just wondered if if that experience uh, is something that you want to say a little bit about here and whether that might be repeated on a larger scale more successfully elsewhere. Sure. Yeah. It, you know, that was in. 2016, 2017, early in the, you know, in the organizing around platform cooperativism. And for us, it was, uh, you know, above all, a kind of educational opportunity to, um, to, to look, to take the chance of a, a kind of crisis at this 
popular platform to open people's minds to the possibility of of co-ownership and 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 even bring it to you know the the annual meeting um which was a lot of fun but um but you know that a lot of the people involved in this you know broke off into a, in a into a few different projects one was right. um creating social.coop which is a, oh, yeah. a cooperatively owned um instance of mastodon which is kind of an open source twitter clone so some people were really focused on how can we create you know our own uh, approach to this in our own image. You know, I'm still a very active member. I use it every day, um, and uh, it, you know, it's not it's not mass media, but it's it's a nice community of of you know co-op friendly folks. Um, and um, and then on the other hand, it's developed into this work around exit to community, um, which is you know a major project of mine still, which is trying to figure out what kinds of strategies can we use to. Um, to make these kinds of transitions to community ownership more available, um, particularly in the tech economy. And, um, you know, a lot of those conversations have bled into, into journalism. So, for instance, um, you know, when, when a, a group of 24 local newspapers here in Colorado uh, uh, ended up getting sold to our journalist-owned um, member-funded Colorado Sun uh, over the summer, and and they used a really creative nonprofit kind of financing vehicle to do it. Um, you know that was thought of as an exit to community strategy. Mm. Um, so, uh, uh, but you know similarly, you could see the you know Salt Lake Tribune going nonprofit as as uh, a model there. The, the idea is to have a kind of really open container for a, a really diverse set of of options um, that encompasses journalism as well as a lot of other sectors. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, we, we, I mean, we've got, we've got uh, just under 15 minutes left. I mean, this, we don't have to carry on any longer than we want to. So just wondering if there's any other con contributions people want to Javier. Javier. I would add uh, to that point uh, that was mentioned by Roger, I think in regards to, to social networks as well, that uh, I think one of the things that, that should be emphasized and, and, and I think News Corp can do a lot is um, regarding uh, media consumption literacy. You know, uh, I think that, that, that this, that's a big issue for all societies. Uh, uh, and when I mean media, I'm not just talking about media organizations, uh, about media, cons oh, I mean, news consumption, you know, and, and, and for example, in Latin America, messaging apps are being very, very important uh, in terms of, of distributing information. And a lot of people is unaware of whatever is happening be be behind that, you know? And, and for example, at Tiempo Argentino, what we did was, um, joining or, or asking for support from Reporters Without Borders. And we create this kind of big map of, of, um, of uh, how do you say, um, who is behind all media. It's the monitor, uh, media monitor uh, in Argentina. And through that and being a co-op, being an independent co-op, we could do the, the whole, the whole uh, we, we, we could make a full, full picture of who was behind each media what happened when you were receiving some kind of information, who, they, who were their main sponsors and stuff. And that helped a lot of people to understand because as you know, there is this kind of pact between media owners uh, that they don't say much about where the money comes from. And, and I think that news co-ops that we have, our supports provided by, by the audience, uh, have, have the possibility of doing that and, and helping to to spread the voice of what is happening there coming from a media outlet and not from the from the academy that most of the time has already that information but maybe the the problem of the academy is that they don't get the people uh, they, they they are stuck in the in in in, in the institutions uh, and so media cops we could we could work uh, on that uh, helping to to provide more information about how do we consume information not only with the information uh, uh, just the information, but also how to understand and how to apply and how to uh, think about what we are consuming uh, in terms of our news diet. Um, and I, I wanted to mention just something quickly that, um, you know, Nathan talking about, 
you know, lateral relationships between members, um, you know, often sort of being seeded to sort of tech companies now about how we relate to each other. We see that a lot in, in companies that um, now sell products to news organizations in the US. So the most sort of popular um, paywall system in the US is called Pico um, among sort of nonprofit, non-commercial newsrooms. Um, it's very expensive. I mean, uh, you know, it's expensive to use, you know, updates have been frustrating. Sometimes, you know, feedback between newsrooms and that organization has not gone well. I worked at a newsroom that used it. Um, just these sorts of tools like that, Substack, for example, um, the sort of newsletter platform, these are such, you know, I feel, can feel very frustrated because they're such wonderful opportunities um, to share governance, um, you know, of all kinds with these tools that everybody uses. Um, so yeah, that's been a major point of frustration for me as a user of these things in newsrooms. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, you know, we haven't talked a ton here about non-commercial and sort of non-profit news, which often gets sort of thrown up as like, this is the better way to do it. Um, I, I, I really would, if anyone wants to talk about it more, um, ways that sort of community ownership of all kinds can help mediate um, some of the risks that we see about philanthropy in news. Um, it's, I don't know what sort of pictures look like in different countries. This is a diverse group, but um, it's a major concern uh, for us. That's really interesting, Olivia, because there's a big debate. And I know Rory is a, 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 on one side of this about what kind of language is used to describe um, different types of organizations with, with a, a purpose of social good. So whether that's social enterprise, whether it is cooperative, whether it's community-based organization, there's, there's a big debate going on there. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, Olivia, Javier, thank you so much for, for joining us today. We've got nine minutes left. So you have four and a half minutes left each for, for your closing statement. So if you could attempt in some way to, to summarize um, your, your thoughts, that, that would be most welcome, if that's okay. So um, Javier, should we start with you? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry for, uh, I was just sharing with Olivia that in Tiempo Argentino, we developed this kind of tool uh, that helps also, for example, to create a, to create a, um, how do you say? Uh, um, a paywall. Paywall, sorry. A paywall, and we, we did it through open source, and we share the code. So if someone is interested, I mean, the code is in English, so it's easy. Maybe the, all the rest is in Spanish, explaining how to do it in Spanish. But if someone is a programmer, uh, it could easily understand what is there, and maybe it's useful for them too. Sorry. And, and Rebecca, now, I, can you please re repeat me what you were saying? Sorry. No problem at all. I wondered, Javier, if you could um, finish by summarizing your, your thoughts on this session, anything that you've taken away from this and, and, and what you're going to go away with do with, with this knowledge that you have. And you now have four minutes. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, as, as I mentioned before, uh, for me, getting into, into co-op uh, was more like um, was by accident to say it somehow. I mean, I was not planning to be part of a co-op. I just happened to be there and we and we found in, in the co-op organization a way to, to, uh, to, to keep doing journalism. We find it as a way of keep doing journalism. It happened to be very successful in Argentina. It happened to open a momentum here. And, and I believe that uh, from all that learning, what we are trying to do is doing things like what I've shared with Olivia, trying to help other people to find the same path. Uh, so I, for me, it's very rewarding to, to find all these other experiences. I try to be part of every place where I'm invited to, to talk about our experience, also to share uh, and, to, and, to, and to give courage to someone that maybe doesn't want to get there because they find that maybe it's, too complicated, you know. I, I don't want to be feel responsible about that. I mean, it's much more easier when someone else takes part of that or or maybe takes care of everything. Uh, but it's really rewarding. It's for sure one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. And I would uh, I would I, I would like to 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 keep being part of this kind of organizations and to help anyone that is interested in in following the same path. Uh, to provide I, what, what I've learned in, in this in this process. So thank you everyone for for being part of this and and for your invitations. 
thank you thank you so much and olivia um i also want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come talk about my master's thesis for the first time out loud and um you know i'm such a nerd about this stuff so it's so much fun to talk to other people who want to chat about it um you know i would say that um you know we talked a lot about the sort of political systems and sort of ideological bedrocks of why things work in different ways in different countries and i think about the potential for policy to trigger changes in the way um our minds work and uh, understand uh, possibility so um you know i focused in my thesis a bunch on um you know legislative initiatives around sort of protecting the public good of news um I've been really inspired by Nathan's work to try to find, you know, new legal um, forms that can support all kinds of like community ownership models um, that, you know, aren't maybe specific to us, you know, a certain industry, a certain sector, but can help um, trigger larger changes in the way that our economy works. Um, so I, you know, I love to support the individual sort of cooperative news organizations that I encounter and love to talk about that with people, but really want to focus on, gosh, like how can we both change, you know, our mental models of how this could work and also change our political models of how this can work. Um, so it's, yeah, it's wonderful to be in community with other people who are thinking about that too. That's wonderful. And I think I'll just round it off by thanking our our, our two facilitators, Rebecca and Nathan. There's a very long list of, of facilitators who've, who've helped us with this seminar series, but I don't think we should close the seminar series without also acknowledging um, the board that we've, we've, we've created something that we call the New Cooperativism Board, which has been behind this seminar series and also uh, special journal issues. So there are three special journal issues in, in production and at different journals trying to build this field of, of interest. Um, so Mary is here. Um, so thank you, Mary, for co-organising. She's a, 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 a co-editor for the one of the special issues as well. Also Jan Myers, who is the editor of the Journal of Cooperative Studies. Um, Linda um, Anderson from Roskilde University, who unfortunately she had some illness issues that sort of uh, disrupted her participation in this, but she was very much part of the early conversations. Marcelo Vieta, who I suspect that some of you in South America will be familiar with. He has uh, made a significant contributor in the early and middle parts of the seminar series. Uh, Silvia Sarchetti, who is at uh, Eurixi, um, who again, she was a, a facilitator and also very involved in the call for papers early on. And Nicole Golovans Ravensburg, uh, who is from the Frankfurt University of Applied Sciences. So. I'm grateful to all of those people and I want it on record that I'm grateful for the support and help that they've given to this seminar series. So thank you everybody for coming to this. Um, you can look forward not just to these seminars coming online, but there are, I think there's an Austrian journal, a German journal and an English language journal that you should see, see the light of day within the next 18 months. Um, and uh, I hope that we can uh, take the conversation about new cooperativism into new communities and places. So thank, thank, you, Rory. thank you. Thank you, Rory. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks, yeah, Rory and Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What is the conversation?